So what we're going to talk about, it was kind of funny because when uh, Katie had asked if I would uh, give a talk, and I said, yeah, well, then she said, okay, we need, a, we need a title, we need a subject. So I said, okay, um, Phoenix, a place giving birth to itself. And then a few weeks later, we've got to give the talk. So okay, so what did I actually say about that? But okay, I first came to get a little bit of background with me. Um, I was at uh, the end of this month, Kim the Abbot of the Sitting Frog Zen Center in uh, Central Queens, and I've written a few books. Oh, I can't hear very well. Oh, so aside from uh, teaching uh, Zen Buddhism, um, I, um, I write novels and um, a lot of journalism. And the way I ended up in Phoenix, I, I moved to Phoenix first in uh, 1995 uh, in Scotland. Um, and I came here, it was quite random the way that I ended up here. I decided to move to America, but didn't really know anything about Phoenix. The reason I decided to move to America is uh, my fourth book could be published and it was the first one published in America, the others would only be published in Europe. And um, what I say about how well my books do in uh, Scotland is that both of, both of my readers think I'm really good. You know, so yeah, I, every book I published over there met with a deafening silence, but did pretty well in America. So I finally thought, okay, you know, I'll, I'll just go over here. So the way I ended up in Phoenix, um, when you have all the details, it's quite complicated. But what really uh, drew me to Phoenix, when I moved here, it was the beginning of a Scottish winter. And I thought, OK, it'd be nice to spend uh, my first winter in America somewhere that's actually warm. And so I chose Arizona. The reason uh, for uh, Phoenix and not Tucson or anywhere else is when I did a bit of reading about places in Arizona. And so I read that Phoenix was this place where people came to escape. You know, people uh, tend to come here and um, they're running from a felony warrant or a bankruptcy or a divorce or you name it, whatever people want to get away from, that traditionally is why they came here, you know. Um, I read that, you know, it was considered pretty bad manners to ask people what brought them to Phoenix. So, of course, I started asking people as soon as I got here. And I found it really interesting that people obviously still um, did feel that way because um, I would say to someone, so... What brought you here? And they would say the bus or a plane. So, you know, uh, that um, tradition of uh, coming here on the run, coming here to start over, uh, was obviously still in place. And it certainly was, it certainly was for me. But I had no idea that I would stay here. And then what shocked the hell out of me is when I showed up in Phoenix within about a week, I knew this place was my home. First place I'd ever called home. And people look at me like some of you are right now gonna say that like I'm absolutely insane, which is true. But there's a bit more to it than that. The thing that I've never ever gotten over uh, about Phoenix is even the things that people say about how horrible it is in so many ways. I even like these things about it, you know, I mean it's the um, you know, it's the only place I've ever been where just walking down the street gets me excited. So I stayed here for about seven years, and then I uh, did the dumbest thing that I've done in my entire life, which is moved to Tennessee for five years. Um, <laughs> don't get me started on that. Well, you know, if I, I'll just say that if I owned hell and I owned Tennessee, I would uh, live in hell and rent out Tennessee. You know? <laughs> but I, I found myself stuck there for a few years. And then I visited Phoenix. Um, I'd been in Tennessee for about five years. Came back out to Phoenix for my visit. And I was only supposed to be here for a few days. And um, I kept extending it to I was here for nearly a month. And when I got back to Phoenix, I um, I'd said to my girlfriend, okay, we, we have to talk. And she said, no, we don't. So why? And she said, just talking to you on the phone over the last few weeks, I've never heard you so happy. Never had you that before. You've got to go back to Phoenix. I'm staying here. So <laughs> she stayed in Tennessee. I came back here. But that's the kind of hope that this uh, city has got over me. You know, I've never, I've never known any place like it. And what, what I think makes it so 
magical for me and for a lot of people. Yeah, if you notice, that, some of you have probably done this, notice how many people bitch and bitch and bitch about Phoenix and they don't leave. Or they do leave and they're right back a few months later. You know, um, Edward Abbey said Arizona is a very easy place to leave. I've left it dozens of times. And he always came back. And I'd say that's particularly true of uh, Phoenix. And I think that the power of this place is, going back to the title of this talk, uh, is a place that's uh, giving birth to itself. Because the great thing about Phoenix, or the horrible thing, depending how you look at it, is the, this place doesn't suffer from bad planning. You know, I've often had to correct people in this and they're complaining about Phoenix and say, this place is terrible planning. No, it didn't. What, what are the plans for Phoenix? There never was one. Phoenix doesn't, didn't, didn't have bad planning. It had no planning whatsoever. Um, Phoenix started as a hustle. It started as a scam, and it's kept on going with that since then. I remember when, um, when Five Simonson get, get convicted on uh, six uh, felony counts. Uh, you get, everyone remember Five? I don't know how long everyone's been here. But for those who don't know, Five Simonson was um, our uh, governor. He was governor when I moved here in 1995. And in the proud tradition of Arizona governors, he not only was a crook, uh, he actually ripped his bottle off for a few million. And finally he got busted, so I covered um, I covered his trial, and afterwards I interviewed the jury. Now the jury had convicted him on six felony counts, okay? Actually seven, but one got thrown out. The only reason Fife didn't go to prison, his pal Bill Clinton pardoned him, you know. Um, but this is great stuff. Talking to the jury after, right after the trial. So they've just convicted this guy on six felony counts. So that's six counts of fraud, embezzlement, theft, what you mean? And every single one of them said that he regretted that he couldn't still be governor. So they're just sending this guy to prison, it looks like, and they wish he could still be governor. They've decided he's a crook, and they don't want him to resign. And I thought, that is, that's, for me, that's Phoenix, you know? And, but Fife Simington, Evan Meekham before him, they're the children of Jack Swilling. Now, Swilling is the, um, the father of Phoenix, and of everything that was on here. Everything that happens right now, actually, you know, a famous or uh, infamous uh, man swindler once said that in Phoenix, when you try to sell people out, they take your first offer. Uh, that's how it's always been. The way this city gets started, <coughs> Jack Swilling was, um, you know, he'd been a, a, a Confederate soldier, I believe, uh, army scout, uh, did all these different things, you know, anything, any, any hustle that he thought could make him some money. And in, I think it was 1836 or 1837, I forget which, uh, he came through the valley and almost nobody lived here because you know, people considered it too hot, even back then. But Swilling saw the uh, remains, I mean, the remains of the canals that the Hopokam had built, and he thought, you know, there's money to be made here. So he just thought, okay, this will, this will work. It's a hustle. So he, um, I hired a few people to come, help clean up the canals. He carried on with his usual drinking, brawling, and swindling. Eventually, got set up uh, uh, for uh, a bank robbery he hadn't committed, and uh, died in prison in um, 1878, I believe it was. That was the founder of Phoenix. So that's how it started. Somebody thought there's, there's potential for a serious scam here. We can make some money in this place, and on and on and on and on. No planning ever. And if you really want to understand Phoenix, or if you think I'm exaggerating and saying that, if you really want to understand uh, the uh, problems that Phoenix has, interestingly enough, it's all revealed in a classic horror movie. Have you all seen Hitchcock's movie, Psycho? Yeah? Okay, well, Psycho begins with, uh, Psycho came out in 1960, and the first shot in Psycho is of um, uh, the, the downtown Phoenix skyline from Camelback Mountain, I think it is. And when you see it, this is, again, this is 1960, and as soon as you see it, you recognize it right away. That is the Phoenix skyline that we see right now. It's instantly recognizable. What other city would have a downtown 
that's recognisable 50 years later. It's going to take a picture now, but you know exactly uh, what you're looking at. Only Phoenix that I can think of. Why? So what happened? Again, no <coughs> money. You know, nobody ever, and quit Jack Swilling for, we could make some money here. So did just about every other huckster, chancer, con artist, and general reprobate, including me. I came to, you know, um, that's why we all come here. You know, you know, I'll get away with something here, and we'll hide out in Phoenix until survive here somehow, things will be okay here. No one ever really decided to create a city. And so the reason that the downtown still looks the same way it did 50 years ago is because very, very little has been added. You know, we just kept building out and out and out and out and out and out and it never stopped. There was never, no one ever thought, okay, this is starting to be a city. Maybe we should do something radical like, I don't know, city planning. Maybe have a meeting or something, decide uh, what we're going to do. And I just kept adding more and more and more. Uh, it was estimated um, about a decade ago that Phoenix was swallowing the desert at the rate of an acre an hour. And it looked to me, I used to say that it looked as though the developers had um, found, I used to call it an ugly bomb. Imagine them dropping bombs that what they did when they exploded was throw up really, really ugly buildings really fast instead of knocking things down, you know, uh, the bomb would explode and another strip bomb would appear. And in um, early, uh, early 2007, just before I moved back here, I uh, ended up here for a while. I flew out here, picked up a car and drove back to Tennessee, packed my things and came back here. But uh, what really shocked me is it used to be when you flew into Phoenix, you know, there was desert, 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 then you'd hit the city, and then the plane would land. And in the five years I had been gone, where it really got out of control, is a um, the plane, and uh, we um, hit the city, just desert, 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 hit the city, kept going, kept going, kept going. Here, are we going to Vegas or something? We're supposed to make start. You know, I mean, that's, that's how much the city had expanded. That's how much the problem had been. And that's why this uh, economy, or oh, lack of an economy now that we have, awful as it is for so many people, it might actually save Phoenix. You know, anything that's put a curve on this um, uncontrolled uh, development might actually save us from uh, destroying ourselves, from destroying this northern desert, and move Phoenix more in the direction of becoming an action deliberate city rather than an, an accidental city. Now, everything I've said about it thus far probably sounds really negative. I love everything about this city. And even, even the things that I've just told you. I mean, the uh, out of control sprawl. I once said to a, um, I once said to a friend that, that I've got a, a novel coming out next year that's um, at Set Phoenix, actually covers a bit of the years that Phoenix is today. And once I showed a part of it to a friend who's never been here. And he said, that sounds like the most horrible place on earth. <laughs> and I was like, as I wrote it, I was gleeful as a writing this stuff. I'm like, kidding, I love this place. What are you talking about? It's great. I mean, and I said, you know, the thing with Phoenix, um, when you walk out the door, if you're really paying attention, you always have this sense that you walk out the door, you might get laid, you might get killed, or anything in between before you go home, and you don't know what's going to happen. There's really that kind of energy uh, about this place. And that's because when I say that Phoenix is a city that's still giving birth to itself, I don't think anyone can make an argument that Phoenix is still not in the process of becoming. Now, you might make an argument about what it's becoming. <laughs> a lot of people fear uh, what it's becoming. But if anyone can make a case that it's not still in the process of becoming, I would love to hear it. Now, you could say that about any place, but you'd be wrong. Look at LA. The reason James Elroy's novels um, about LA are set 50 years ago is because it stopped becoming 50 years ago. Not that things don't develop and change in LA like in any other city, you know, but the city was planned, it came into being, has its identity, and that's it. And I won't say it's static, it's kind of still constantly evolving, but you know, um, there's a definable entity called Los Angeles. How do you define Phoenix? 
there's a, a book that came out um, a, a few months ago called Phoenix Noir, an anthology of, um, of short stories by different writers, uh, including me. And what's really kind of fascinating about it, about that book, is the sheer diversity of the stories. Uh, I mean, you know, you think uh, we're, we're really talking about the same place. And the editor of um, uh, Phoenix Noir, Patrick Milligan, uh, when we were doing some readings to promote the book, uh, Patrick said that one of the things that fascinated him about Phoenix and made him want to edit the anthology is that you can be walking, um, you, you, can, you can walk for 10 minutes and feel you're in a different city. You know, to walk, to walk a couple blocks and your environment completely changes. The culture that surrounds you that completely changes. You know, and that's certainly like nobody else uh, that I've ever been. And again, the reason for that is that nobody has ever got together trying to figure out what this city is, or what this city ought to be, or what it could be. You know, I say that Jack Swilling is um, the father of uh, Phoenix, but you know, really, Phoenix is like something again. It's like a child in a horror movie, doesn't it? It's like a child without parents. Like some little monster that just came from somewhere, no one knows quite sure where it came from, and then expanded, expanded, get bigger, and then started devouring uh, everything around it, you know? And that's, that is horrifying. I mean, it's an environmental <coughs> worst nightmare. But at the same time, I think you would have to, I think you'd have to be completely dead inside not to find the kind of girl. You know, I mean, um, the sheer spectacle of it, you know, is, um, it's exciting. Yeah, I mean, it gets me in a way that no other place um, ever has. And now when you look at the, um, when you look at the crisis that we find ourselves in, and um, some fairly enlightened people trying to, um, impose um, some kind of vision on Phoenix. Phil Gordon, you know, um, doing what I think the best thing that's happened to the city, adding the light rail. And you look at the amount of resistance there was to that, and you notice that when people argue over these things, I mean, the people who tried to stop the light rail, it wasn't people saying, well, no, let's not put in a light rail, let's do this or that instead. No, let's not do that, why not? And we always hear the same argument. Phoenix wasn't built for something like that. Yeah, Phoenix wasn't built for anything. So, you know, I mean, if we um, if we decide uh, that's the rationale, we might as well stop drinking water, stop putting on sunscreen, and just sit out in the desert and bake to death because yeah. that's what that's what would happen naturally if we don't do anything. You know, there never was any planning right here. And the, for me, the real excitement of living in Phoenix comes from the tension between the fact that it's um, completely unsustainable, I can make that argument, it's completely unsustainable, but it has to be sustained because more and more people love living here and aren't going to leave. It's a place that has to be made to work. And uh, a lot of people uh, say that it's an awful place, who would want to live here? I remember um, 10 years ago, my favourite um, fiction, my favourite uh, fiction magazine, the Arizona Republic, um, <laughs> published an article um, last, uh, about ten years ago when they said they had done a study that said that more than half of the uh, population of Phoenix would leave right now because, well, then if you see a small logical flaw in that premise. Our big problem here is overpopulation. Explosions of uncontrolled development. People coming here and not leaving. So maybe some bit of a contradiction there between that and what the Republic reported. The reason that Phoenix uh, has to be made to work is because in spite of all the problems, it really comes down to one thing. People like it here. People come here and they don't leave. And I certainly will never leave. You know, I've been told you'd never say never. I just couldn't conceive of uh, ever wanting uh, to live anywhere else. You know, 
didn't give Tennessee much of a chance, as much as I hated Tennessee, Senator Governor Valley, I could have gone anywhere and I was still compared with the Phoenix, you know. So, where we are right now in um, Phoenix's history, I think it's probably the most um, exciting time uh, in the city's history. Certainly the uh, most pivotal time since uh, Jack Spillman showed up and decided to see if he could make some money by uh, uh, renovating and cleaning up the Holcomb canals. Because the, um, we've hit peak oil, you know, the days of cheap <coughs> oil are over. I think it would be hard to make any uh, rational argument that the economy is going to come back, not how it was before. You know, I mean, the, um, the toy store is closed. You know, I mean, the, uh, the, the free ride uh, that we've had for the last 30, maybe 40 years is gone. It's unsustainable. And what does that mean uh, for Phoenix? Hard though it's going to be uh, for most of us, we're at a point now where Phoenix is finally being forced uh, to uh, define itself, to actually understand itself. You know, we're the uh, fifth biggest uh, municipality in the country. More people are coming. Most of us um, are not going to leave. By the way, I know some of you think you're going to leave. I guarantee you, I take bets on this. Of those of you who hate it here and are planning to leave, half of you will be back in a year. Okay? That's, that's just what happens. You know, people just don't stay away. And it's funny because every time I say that to people, listen, he's wrong. Not, not me, not me. They're not talking about me. Yeah, I yeah. am. So we're at a stage now where um, this, uh, the valley really has to figure out how to live. Really has to figure out uh, how to uh, sustain itself. Uh, the light rail is certainly a step in that direction. The um, uh, downtown market is uh, certainly a step in that direction. CSAs are um, a, a real a step in that direction. But we still don't have a plan. And as Phoenix gives, gives birth to itself, with no parenting, no one actually guiding at the city, it's fascinating to see uh, that it naturally takes um, a turn in uh, the direction of health. The, just any, any organism, and this city is a living organism, that's what any city is. Every organism is programmed to survive. And we can naively see um, the city as just a bunch of buildings and people living in those buildings. That would be a very naive view, and it would be a view that completely ignores history. The inspiring thing about Phoenix is that the city came into being by accident, was never supposed to survive, Sh logically shouldn't have survived, shouldn't still be here, but like any uh, organism, any living organism uh, that's programmed to survive, it has. It's survived and it's grown. And we're now at a historical point where the city either will die, like every organism does, or, as I think is much more likely, will adapt and evolve and find ways to become whatever it's going to become. And that's why I say it's still giving birth to itself. Uh, what that progeny will be, I don't know, and neither do you, but it's, um, it's definitely going to be a fascinating ride. There's an old uh, Chinese curse um, that doesn't really sound like anything awful, but it's quite scary when you think about it. In traditional uh, Chinese culture, the worst thing you can say to someone, that you can wish on someone, is uh, may you live in interesting times. You know, the kind of times they make in history books. Um, that's the um, that's the kind of time we're living in. We're living through it right now. And I couldn't be happier about it. Okay, well, continue to talk at you. It's kind of funny when, uh, uh, when I asked Katie how long you should um, speak for, she said, as long as you want. When you get me talking to Phoenix, I'll be here at midnight if I uh, talk uh, as long as I want. So, is there any questions or comments? Uh, obviously, I'm an immigrant as well. Uh, same sort of place as you, but a couple of hundred miles south. Um, 
You talk about um, being able to walk around in Phoenix and see culture change within 10 minutes walking around. I've been in a whole bunch of cities where that's the case. I've never noticed that anywhere in Phoenix. Where are you talking about that I haven't been? For example, I would take London, right? Huge city, very, very diverse. All of it's recognisably London, though. Or I would say it is, you know. Um, uh, you know, I mean, you, you, you know you're in London, um, Glasgow, where I'm from, wherever you go, you know you're in Glasgow. In uh, Phoenix, I mean, walk, I mean, walk 10, 15 minutes, you might not think you're on the same planet that you were on uh, 10 minutes ago. It's just uh, the, the radical uh, diversity uh, that, we, um, that, that we have here is like nowhere else uh, that I've ever been.